Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, you know, um, I'm sure that we all remember these photographs. Uh, I'm going to point out this particular one, which was a, a pile of people who were put up. They were held in this position by being stomped on whenever their toes stuck out, which accounts for the bruising on their feet. Uh, and then um, they were jumped on like a leaf pile. The thing that has not been as widely reported in this picture is that up to the side of this picture, uh, in this room, uh, while this picture was being taken, was a nurse. Uh, the nurse was actually called into the room because the soldier standing up there, the male guy, uh, had struck a prisoner in the chest. He had dropped down saying, I can't breathe, and became unconscious. The soldier thought that he had killed the guy and uh, called in the nurse who administered an inhaler, said he's faking, and walked out without reporting the incident. Um, this uh, then becomes a picture of abuse by guards but this picture also raises the question of what was the relationship between the medical profession and these types of abuses. Now, I'm not going to, I'm going to skim through the policy background on this in order to focus on the medical ethics questions. Uh, but I would like to point out that battlefield ethics are one thing, uh, but essentially there's a separate ethics when you're off the battlefield. And the battlefield, off the battlefield, includes people who are prisoners. Uh, and in that regard, detained, 
uh, are supposed to not be subjected to violence, uh, murder, mutilation, outrages on personal dignity, humiliating or degrading treatment. That's the Geneva Convention. Uh, and they're also not to be subjected to uh, any kind of torture to secure information. And they're not also to be threatened with any uh, torture if they don't supply information. Uh, these principles are not only embodied in the Geneva Convention, uh, but they are also embodied in a series of other uh, acts. The United States has specifically endorsed the Geneva Conventions, but it also passed the War Crimes Act, which is important because the War Crimes Act, in addition to our ratification of the Geneva Convention, specifically says that the Geneva Conventions and the Hague Conventions are the law of the land. So we essentially ratified the Geneva Conventions uh, and the Hague Conventions pertaining to torture twice, uh, once by a Congressional Act and once by statute. In addition to that, there are these UN Principles of Medical Ethics, which regard, uh, pertain to the protection of prisoners against torture. And these apply essentially to all health professionals and the Geneva Convention itself specifically mentions the duties of medical personnel, physicians, and so forth uh, with regard to uh, special roles to assure in compliance with its various provisions for the treatments of detainees. The actions that happened in Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, Tikrit, uh, and approximately other 40, 40 other centers in Iraq and Afghanistan were not the acts of a few bad apples. Uh, they were essentially a top-down policy that was directed uh, from the administration. I won't review the recent history of this from, because uh, in the context of the confirmation of Attorney General Gonzalez, this was uh, extensively discussed, except to say that in August of 2002, the Justice Department essentially tried to distinguish between cruel and humane or degrading treatment, which was permitted, from torture, which was ordinarily banned, uh, except even torture could be uh, permitted if the president needed to do it as a part of his discretionary war-making powers. And then it did this bizarre uh, analysis of what severe harm and profound disruption of personality meant. This uh, memo is uh, the operating memo that was uh, ultimately constructed. It was uh, signed by President Bush. And as you can see in uh, paragraph three, um, it says that uh, our nation has been and will continue to be a strong supporter of Geneva and its, prin Geneva and its principles as a matter of policy. And one could put a big however there. Uh, the United States Army uh, Armed Forces shall continue to treat detainees humanely and to the extent appropriate and consistent with military necessity in a manner consistent with the principles of Geneva, essentially subordinating uh, Geneva uh, to military necessity. Uh, following that memo, uh, the Secretary of Defense authorized a series of counter-resistance techniques uh, including uh, the following. Uh, and his uh, memo and policy directives in that regard subordinated the, the Geneva Convention to military necessity. And he went beyond that to say nothing in this memo in any way restricts your existing authority to maintain good order and discipline. Uh, it also noted that a number of the provisions that were authorized in this memo um, uh, violated uh, the Geneva Convention and said that consideration to that view should be given, but did not direct compliance with the Geneva Convention. The policies that were designed for Guantanamo then spread to Afghanistan and from Afghanistan to Iraq. It's important to note with regard to medical personnel that the Justice and Defense Department memorandum in no way distinguished between the roles of medical personnel and other soldiers. They excuse the use of drugs during interrogation. They make absolutely no reference to the specific UN conventions that uh, apply specifically to uh, medical complicity within humane treatment. And furthermore, uh, the Secretary of Defense said that the interrogation officers 
can allow uh, decide whether or not a prisoner can request a, a medical evaluation, uh, which uh, directly violates a provision of Geneva, which says that a prisoner can request medical evaluation at any time. Uh, in fact, the Secretary of Defense went on to specifically say that um, the uh, interrogation techniques are uh, should be applied according to these safeguards. Number three, the detain detainee is medically and operationally evaluated as suitable uh, and uh, intervals between applications termination criteria and the presence of qualified medical personnel have been developed. That is, that medical professionals were directly involved in titrating the level and severity of interrogation uh, and for also deciding how long the inter abuse of interrogation should continue. This is the interrogation poster that was at Abu Ghraib. It was taken, uh, adopted from one that was in Afghanistan. And you'll notice that it says that wounded or medically burdened detainees must be medically cleared prior to interrogation. And that it also allows for what's called dietary manipulation, that is withholding food or water monitored by med uh, up there at the top. Now, there were a series of offenses that were done uh, at uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and now Guantanamo. I've been out of the country, so I'm not up, totally up to date on Guantanamo. Um, but these look pretty much like the range of types of abuse, human rights abuses we've seen uh, in many other countries. But I'd like to focus specifically on the medical system. Uh, the medical system has been evaluated by a series of investigations. And at this time, actually, I'm now up to um, uh, 14,000 pages of downloaded material, which some of which is uh, fairly opaque. I'll show you some of it, actually. Uh, this is one of my favorites, actually. <laughs> it's uh, a little hard to read. <laughs> uh, other parts are um, more are more legible, uh, and then parts of it, uh, parts of the pages are uh, handwritten and are various variously uh, scrutable, but they allow you to actually make a fairly clear assessment. There was absolutely no system of internment cards. There was no TB screening. There was no separation of persons with TB. People who died of TB, weren't, there was no case tracing in the cell blocks. They failed to allow medical prisoners to request medical evaluation. They did not notify families of deaths, sicknesses, or transfers to other medical facilities. All of those occurred in every detention center uh, and uh, were a widespread abuse. Interrogation. Uh, what happened in interrogation was that the interrogation plans were developed uh, by military intelligence uh, in collaboration with something called biscuits. Uh, these are not powder milk biscuits. Um, what these are is uh, science consultation teams, each of which was chaired by a psychiatrist, a physician, uh, or a uh, psycho psychologist. And they took the uh, personal medical data of the person from the medical, whatever medical records there were, combined it with various cultural uh, insights that they had. For example, um, this business of uh, throwing menstrual blood on uh, Islamic men is a, uh, had to come out of a biscuit. Uh, and uh, withholding, uh, feeding pork to uh, prisoners, forcing them to drink alcohol and so forth. Uh, and they designed these course of uh, interrogations. In addition, the general medical system gave records to the interrogators with the understanding that would be used for the development of the interrogation plans. Uh, this occurred at every site where, invest where intelligence investigations were done. Uh, then there's the business of uh, false medical reporting. Uh, the death certificates were essentially falsified in toto. Um, for example, uh, you take a guy like General Mahoush. Uh, General Mahoush was an uh, Iraqi uh, Air Force general who was uh, stuffed inside of a, uh, he was beaten, then he was stuffed inside of a sleeping bag, 
uh, head first, then a uh, soldier sat on his chest, and then he asphyxiated. Uh, then uh, a medic was called to the room, uh, attempted to revive him. The surgeon came to the room, and the surgeon recorded the cause of death as a natural cause of heart attack. Uh, the story leaked out, and then eight months later, they rewrote the death certificate to call it uh, a, a homicidal asphyxia. Um, and in fact, uh, right now, uh, of the deaths that have been identified in uh, uh, detention centers, fully half were, were uh, homicidal. But in addition to that, a number of deaths were not reported to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in violation of Army policy at the discretion of the base commanders. Uh, the death certificates were actually signed, prepared, and released in block in May of 2004 in preparation for a uh, press conference. And one can actually see that in terms of the types of inks and the dates of the final signatures on the death certificates. Uh, all of these acts are in direct violation of Armed Forces Institute of Pathology policy. Um, and you have uh, very sporadic instances of uh, detainee or medical personnel striking uh, detainees, uh, dancing on them. Uh, one guy said, gosh, you know, you're wearing full bar body armor. Uh, you have absolute power. It's such a rush. Uh, or you have, for example, the detainee who was uh, uh, beaten up uh, by a guard. Uh, the medic came in to suture up a laceration on the ear, uh, and uh, he then gave the suturing material to the guard who then sutured the laceration while the medic watched, and then the medic walked out and did not report the event. The guard is sanctioned, the medic is anonymous. Um, and then you have the wholesale failure to report abuses. Essentially, the entire medical system appears to have known about these abuses. Uh, and yet, interestingly enough, even though military intelligence and the FBI was regularly making reports and complaints, of military intelligence frontline officers and FBI agents were sending blistering memos up the chain of command which were being ignored. Prior to the emergence of the 2004 Army investigations, I could not find a single instance of any healthcare professional making a single complaint uh, chain of command with regard to the maltreatment of detainees. And in fact, they want to, to um, uh, deliberately uh, falsify medical records and not record beating injuries. Um, these instances started at the bottom. The uh, local site commanders uh, responded to Red Cross investigations in 2002 and 2003 by restricting Red Cross access. Um, and a um, variety of excuses offered for this, including training and so forth. Um, I don't think that it's a few criminally inclined uh, guards. Um, I think that the policies were lax or permissive with regard to human rights abuses. Uh, but I think, I think it also raises a kind of a fundamental question for the medical profession. Um, the overall military personnel get a 36-minute film on human rights and U.S. traditions, um, a film, kind of a public health film, you know, like Reefer Madness. Um, <laughs> And, uh, however, none of the medical personnel uh, who were in a large survey uh, done, conducted by the uh, Secretary General of the Army were able to identify any training in human rights issues, um, which I think is a notable failure, but I don't think it's sufficient to explain the problem. Uh, I think that, in some ways, the larger question here besides the issues for Abu Ghraib for the whole standing of uh, international law have to do with the questions of health professionals in terms of their relationship to institutions where an institution, whether be it a detention center uh, or an HMO, uh, sets up a condition, say, for uh, 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 inadequate health care. Uh, or where a practice is set up that is or may be abusive, what is the advocacy response to go outside of the rules to assure a professional advocacy for our patients? 
uh, where where does complicit the line or the ethical line between complicity uh, and, uh, active complicity and passive complicity through silence uh, how does that engage our professional responsibilities I think that these are all uh, general questions that we can draw off of Abu Ghraib I do think that this represents a substantial break in the traditions with regard to the U.S. military. As far as I can see, this is a break from U.S. military medicine's uh, behavior in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Although the issue of inadequate health care uh, for uh, uh, POWs in the United States has a sorry history uh, that I'm sure is known in this state with regard to uh, Civil War detainees on both uh, sides. Uh, one of the things that we've done with this instance is we have profoundly damaged the framework of international law. Our ability to advocate on behalf of Red Cross visits for, say, uh, sequestered uh, Chinese dissidents uh, to uh, ask that uh, Burma uh, or Myanmar uh, not torture human rights workers um, has all been uh, radically uh, impaired. And in addition to that, I think that we have to uh, we have to recall the memory of uh, Private First Class Maupin, who, um, until the Abu Ghraib photographs became uh, 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 published, uh, every single one of our soldiers who were POWs uh, in the war in Iraq uh, were actually recovered safely and alive. They either escaped or were rescued. However, after the Abu Ghraib photographs came out, uh, Private uh, First Class Maupin was executed um, by, the, um, by uh, groups in uh, Iraq, specifically citing the Abu Ghraib experience. And I'm unaware of any surviving POW since the Abu Ghraib scandal. Uh, however, we define the uh, groups uh, that are fighting U.S. forces in Iraq. They were operating uh, in uh, rough parallel to the uh, Geneva Conventions, at least with regard to assuring the survival of, uh, of uh, POWs until this uh, scandal broke. I'll stop here and allow ample time for questions. On anything. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there were some of the people who were involved in the abuses did work in the uh, prison. Some of the people who were involved in the photographed abuses did work in the civilian prison system, but that is not true of the overall pattern of abuse. Uh, they were general military people. I, I, just to make some general comments on interrogation, I actually had a rather interesting year reading stuff that I never read before. Um, there's actually a huge research literature on interrogation techniques. Um, comes from Israel, comes from uh, the conflict in Ireland, and in fact, the U.S. government under Project Kubark did uh, 20 years of interrogation research from 55 to 75, which included the infamous LSD experiments. And it's pretty much been shown that you cannot uh, beat information out of people. In fact, uh, Torture actually validates the perception that the torturer is an evil person. Uh, and it is a rite of passage uh, for which uh, people can prepare themselves. And it essentially validates their membership in the group that is being tortured. Uh, it does not secure reliable information and essentially has been abandoned as a technique. So what's so interesting is that the policies which allowed this type of mistreatment um, were permissive, not directive. What amazes me is that military intelligence went ahead and, 
and oversaw a system which implemented them, given that they had ample empirical data, over 250 studies in the U.S. alone, to show that this kind of approach didn't work. Um, furthermore, one of the things that's interesting about the uh, uh, prisoners is that over 70% of the Guantanamo prisoners and 90% of the Iraqi prisoners, and I don't have statistics on the Afghan prisoners, uh, are by, according to the Army's own statement, entirely innocent. They were just picked up in sweeps. So you had a very inefficient program which essentially terrorized and, and alienated a population and turned out to be enormously dysfunctional or uh, counterproductive. Yeah. Do you think <clears throat> that um, people are expressing a certain level of personal sadism in the name of interrogation? Yeah, I think there is a certain sadism, but I guess the way I would put it is this. I think uh, the historical record suggests that while all cu cultures and societies seem to be capable uh, uh, of practicing torture, particularly on stigmatized groups. Nevertheless, all cultures and all societies also seem capable of producing individuals who can resist that, that summons by their society, whether it's Nazi Germany uh, or whether uh, it's the U.S. Army. And I think that the, one of the questions for uh, military medicine is, is there some way that military medicine or medicine in general can recruit its own moral resources so that it can properly stand aside from the types of social and organizational pressures which pull it in that direction? Um, so, I mean, yes. Uh, yes, that's true, but no, I don't think it's, it's sufficient because I don't think it would have taken a lot of voices to stop this. Yes, sir. Well, I have just a few of low-ranking individuals who have been blamed for this problem. And what's happened to the general in charge of the prison, and Secretary Rumsfeld, and others? Yeah, I, the question has to do with where, why is the accountability being moved downstream? Well, I think I think it's a little premature to assess where the accountability will lie. I I think, in some senses, the Secretary of Defense. Um, will be judged uh, by history rather than by a court. Uh, and I think that, that that judgment is is coming in and will come in in history books uh, as well. Uh, there are technical violations of Army procedure, but as you know, the Secretary of Defense is a civilian, and so he's accountable to the uh, government. Now, it's also important to note that with regard to the International War Crimes uh, Court, uh, the U.S. is not a signatory to that convention, and uh, there's been a tremendous effort to establish an international framework beyond Geneva to address certain types of issues, recruitment of child soldiers, use of chemical and biological weapons, landmines, uh, uh, rape as a weapon of war, genocide, um, uh, and so forth. And uh, we've essentially stood outside of the landmines, the war crimes court, uh, we were slow on the uh, child soldiers issue. And I don't think there's any chance for prosecution of the Secretary of Defense, but I think the historical record is sufficient at this point that history will make the call. Yes, sir. In your, in your review, was there any documentation or documented examples of medical professionals resisting orders and any uh, details of what happened after that, or was there just sort of no doctor that at all. No, I can't find, I mean, part of the, to be fair, um, compared to the FBI traffic, uh, email traffic, for example, you can now download all the FBI email traffic off the uh, ACLU website. Uh, really boring. If you're doing that, get a life, okay? Um, or get a grant, <laughs> one of the two. Um, I've decided to do it, but I need a life. Um, and with regard to military intelligence memos now, that email traffic with regard to the abuse situations is also coming out, okay? So you can download that. There was no comparable 
to my mind, there's not any comparable chain of command for the uh, military medicine system, but so far, in all of the investigatory documents I've looked at, and now I've actually read all 15,000, 14,000 pages, I don't see any medical protest, not a single one. And furthermore, with regard to the inadequate health care system as a whole structure, uh, I've now identified the single uh, brigadier general who is responsible for that system, uh, who is based in uh, Decatur, Georgia, and um, as the scandal broke, he was promoted. Yes? Um, locally, this is more mundane in a sense. Locally, uh, the governor is a physician and got into a little bit of lukewarm water um, when he signed a death warrant. Yeah. Um, and there were medical ethics considerations raised. His response was that he was sort of wearing his governor hat instead yeah. of his physician hat. And I wonder. I mean, I guess my, my concern, I think that's, that's a bit of a cop up, but on the other hand, my concern is that if you create a society where people are always wearing their professional hat, um, so to speak, um, they, you end up excluding a lot of good people from a lot of work that needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the question that's raised has to do with the governor's signature of a death warrant here and, uh, and also the question of how many hats can a doc wear? Um, first, let me respond to the governor's decision. Um, while it is true that the, all the professional societies say that a physician should not be involved in capital punishment, and they define a whole set of ways that that uh, involvement should not occur, it's also fascinating that in a famous California Supreme Court decision, uh, Dr. Th uh, Kim Thornburg, who was the uh, physician at San Quentin, said, well, look, if all the professional societies say that docs should not engage in capital punishment and that that's unprofessional conduct, and if the Medical Board of California is supposed to sanction docs who engage in unprofessional conduct, then they should apply license sanctions to any doc who assists with execution. Uh, perfectly fine argument. I signed on to the amicus brief on that one in a heartbeat. Um, however, um, AMA and California Medical Association actively opposed it, and the uh, lawsuit went down. The governor, uh, I think, was not acting in the capacity of the physician whatsoever. Okay? However, when I'm treating a prisoner, I am defined by treaty and by my actions as providing medical care to that prisoner. I'm serving that prisoner's personal interests. And when I supply that information to an interrogator who is using that information to titer the level of interrogation, uh, I am essentially agreeing to let my medical information be used to work against that prisoner's interests, and I'm also agreeing to allow a violation of international law which says you can't do a course of interrogation. So I've committed a double violation. Um, and so I think that given that the duty of station for a, given that we do not allow prisoners to have their choice of physician, we have to have those prisoners, uh, account, have the prison health professionals accountable to those prisoners' uh, health interests rather than to serving the interests of inflicting uh, punishment or interrogation as well. It's a separate, it's a separate question. Frankly, if I had been uh, Governor Fisher, is that his name? Fletcher. Fletcher. Uh, I would have, um, to resolve any ambiguity on the matter, I would have relinquished my license before I signed such an order, although being uh, opposed to capital punishment I would have followed the lead of the governor of Illinois in order to suspension of all capital punishment and then, uh, and then uh, taken the political consequences. Anybody else? Yeah. What if any uh, protections are available to health care uh, professionals in Illinois? The question is protections that are available for health care professionals. I think that's a very important question, and um, let me address it this way. 
Um, I work with, uh, I, I've been blessed in being able to work in a number of countries around the world, and uh, including with my uh, colleagues in Turkey and the Turkish Medical Society, who've been conducting a valiant effort against torture in their own country. Uh, one of my colleagues is Dr. Uzum. Uh, Dr. Uzum uh, maintains a registry of torture victims and, uh, and uh, documents the abuses that they get in police and prison systems. Uh, for which his clinic was raided. Uh, he was taken, he was beaten, he was, uh, uh, had a uh, cl wet cloth wrapped around his face till he nearly uh, asphyxiated and he was sodomized with a, a Coke bottle uh, before being released. And then he went back to his work and the Turkish Medical Society endorsed him. Um, I think the thing that is just so striking to me when I look at physicians and human rights and torture work around the world is the extraordinary risks that our colleagues are taking in, in Uruguay, Paraguay, uh, the, Soviet, the former Soviet Union, Chile, Argentina to resist torture, uh, often at the peril of their lives, their family lives, or uh, being disappeared. I don't think that the risks to any U.S. medical personnel remotely came close to the risks that those other professionals were, were taking. And I think the worst that they faced was perhaps a six-month tour providing medical, primary medical care in Antarctica. Uh, and so that I am unimpressed by the argument uh, that they faced career sanctions, dismissal, or court-martial uh, uh, for this, uh, for this, particularly when I when I look at my colleagues in other countries. Yeah, I'd like to apply this to medical students as they go on into their clinical lives. Because when we talked about this last evening, what I'd like for you to do is comment a bit on your medical ethics experience when. Medical students are often asked to do things that they feel may be wrong, they're not quite sure why it's wrong, but they know that it's not quite right, such as signing prescriptions for residents when patients are being discharged because, gee, it's faster and I don't have time to do it. Yeah. Or calling themselves doctor when they go in and misrepresenting themselves to patients because they're superiors, they're attending, so they're residents to call themselves. But even more so, the case, the extreme that I talked about was doing intubations in the emergency room on a newly dead individual who's just won't no. from a uh, motor vehicle accident and the attendance is here, practice your intubations on this course. How can medical students challenge the moral authority of their superiors at a time when they feel that the power of the makes them extremely vulnerable, their grades ride on it, and how can they do something to respond to such difficulties? Well, I think the question of how does any clinician, medical student, nurse, or whatever, respond to a morally challenging situation begins, first you have to define what your obligations really are. Um, and for the docs over there to say, well, we weren't aware of our international obligations. Well, I don't know. Gosh, if I went to uh, Kenya, I would learn what the, uh, you know, I'd learn about malaria, right? Okay. Uh, if I'm off to a war zone where, by definition, human rights are an issue, uh, gosh, I'd scan the human rights document. In fact, every soldier has a 3 by 5 card with the Geneva Convention printed on it. It's not hard to read. It's no longer than an antibiotic flip chart, you know, that you use all the time. And it doesn't even have Merck printed on the bottom of it. Um, it's got U.S. Army printed on the bottom of it. And so I think the first question is you gather information about what is the standard that applies. Perhaps my sentiment of uh, moral qualm is misplaced in the first place. This is just a novel situation that I don't feel comfortable with. Uh, that is, you don't need an EEG to declare a person dead, okay? Um, but on the other hand, I think that once you identify uh, an area where the standard of care seems to be violated. And for example, in, with regard to the literature on practicing on the newly dead, there's a large literature on that that's easy to find on Medline. And every student now has one of these, and there are wireless networks all over the place. Um, 
then you see that the emergency room policy does not conform to that, then you start taking it up the chain of command. If the chain of the command is not responsive, then you consider options that go outside of the chain of command. Probably the five o'clock news is your last venue, um, but sooner or later you're going to wind up with somebody who says, gosh, if, if uh, you know, the AMA says this is a bad idea, maybe we ought to stop doing this. And you'll find somebody who says, we really don't want to have the exposure from having this thing blow up in our face. I had no idea this was going on in our institution. So I'd kind of go that way. And if only the docs in Abu Ghraib had done that, or Guantanamo had done that, we would have been in a much different situation today. One thing I'll add, too, is besides going up the chain of command through a medical team, it could also go up through like associate deans for yeah. students. No. Well, also through hospital ethics committees. We had to deal yeah. with this when I was at another hospital chairing that committee, and we found out that they were using paralytics for patients when they were being withdrawn from ventilators, yeah. effectively killing the patients. No, you got, you got, hospitals have got redundancies of consultations. That's how a teaching hospital works. You can, even if you go to a senior resident, you eventually go over to an ethics committee or an administrator or a dean. Yeah. Do you have any evidence that the uh, military has systematically changed its practices since the use of the deal? I'm sorry, can you say that a little louder? Any evidence that the uh, military has systematically changed its practices since the use of the deal? Well, that's kind of an interesting question. Um, yeah, well, a couple. Um, first, their response to the paper was interesting. Um, they immediately issued a two-page press report saying this is an outrageous smear on the good men and women who serve in the armed forces. Frankly, I agree with that. Um, uh, but the facts are based on our own investigations. It shows that we're taking it seriously. Um, I was a little puzzled by that. Um, and then the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology and I got into a big fight over their death certificates. Uh, now, uh, and then, uh, I don't know if I have anybody at this talk, but uh, about half my talks I've had military intelligence people and uh, JAGS people introduce themselves. So I don't know if there's anybody here from there. If you are, hi, introduce yourselves. Um, to hear the presentation, the talk, but I also know that the Pentagon has now formed a task force to address this question and um, uh, is looking into uh, a much more careful look at it, as am I. I'll be publishing a book on this sometime this year um, to match their report. Um, so my guess is that actually we will see some substantial change out of this because uh, also the World Medical Association has picked up on this question. They've passed a uh, resolution on this matter. And I think that what we're going to see is uh, damage has been done here, uh, profound damage, not just to the Geneva Accords, but also to the question of what is the military, the relationship of military medicine to these types of abuses. And to some extent, I think that um, war always damages civil society. I mean, that's just the nature of war. Uh, but one of the questions is if there's any redemption from war, it's the extent to which we use the lessons of war. Uh, to develop new means to not simply rebuild the buildings, but to also, in some s structural way, atone for the civil dam damage to the civil society that's been done. The Geneva Conventions themselves were an attempt to atone for the uh, damage to a civil society that was done by World War II. Uh, the Convention on Biological Weapons was done to atone for the damage to civil society that was done by uh, the gas warfare of uh, World War I. And I think to some extent it's too soon to say what the response will be to Abu Ghraib, including the military side of it. But I expect that there will be one, uh, even if it doesn't come out of this administration. Yep. Um, you know, it seems to me that it doesn't take knowing medical ethics or knowing the Geneva Convention to know that it's wrong to treat people that way. That what needs to be explained is how people can be so socialized and
lawyers be so dissociated that they can justify to themselves doing it. Yeah. And and I'm, I'm going back to the question about education. Um, is there something that needs to happen in medical school uh, to to make sure that that people have the the tools so that they can resist the kind of socialization that well, I think that's I, I think that's true. I I think part of what may have happened here is that I don't frankly I don't believe there's such a thing as ethics on a battlefield. I say this as a person who's worked now in four, and I just don't believe it. Okay, and I think what fundamentally happened uh, in these camps was that people lost the distinction between a detention center and the battlefield. And they basically believed they were on a battlefield. Uh, in Abu Ghraib, that was easy because the place was being mortared. Uh, but, um, and so therefore, it was battlefield ethics, whereas in fact, these people were outside of combat. Um, I think also, I would not discount the enormous stress of being on a battlefield. It's just outrageous. Um, but be that as it may, um, the military has mechanisms for working in a high-stress environment. Otherwise, all soldiers would go nuts all the time, and they wouldn't be able to do the job of soldiering. This is a special form of soldiering. And there was a major breakdown of policy and accountability that went from the top down and then from the bottom up. Uh, one more, and then I'll close. I'll tell you, I haven't done you yet. Yes. A lot of you folks that on um, the medical personnel and the military personnel who made this happen. What about the United States public who doesn't seem to be as excited about this as they are basketball team? What about the United States who's not concerned about this as a basketball team? Well, I think, um, you know, Private first class mopping is uh, is uh, all of our all of our sons and all of our brothers, and I think that at some point, um, one of the problems I think with the United States is that we are pretty parochial for being an empire. Um, you look at the uh, recent tsunami damage, for example. You had something like a thousand Swedes who died, and, you know, 1,500 Germans, I think 800 Swiss. Um, 20 Americans. Uh, where I travel, and I travel a lot, I don't see Americans. Americans go to Cancun. I mean, that's our idea of foreign travel. And I think that one of the questions is going to be that if, if we really want to engage ourselves in a global society, aside from a simply mercantile uh, society, if we really want to understand how human rights works and, and the importance of these civil laws work, we're going to have to get out more. Because when civil society breaks down like this, what happens is it does produce local consequences, as in the execution of, of uh, private Maupin, perhaps, uh, or in the arrival of Haitian refugees, uh, or whatever. And I think that, um, I think everybody agrees uh, that as we went into Iraq, we went in with a fundamental lack of understanding of how Iraq society was built. We also went in with a lack of, of even translators. For example, the public affairs, the uh, uh, State Department's uh, chief of public affairs in Saudi Arabia does not speak Arabic. Go figure. Um, and so I think that the question of, of our relationship with the world is really related to our inability to carry out these types of multicultural endeavors. Uh, successfully, and we're going to have to address that if we really want to play a successful global role. Thank you.